This is Damien Lanane, former prisoner and illustrator of the book This Is Ear Hustle. The following episode of Ear Hustle contains language that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Discretion is advised. Are you playing Candy Crush? Yeah. Yes. What level are you on? 89. Oh, I, I love this game. On <laughs> I'm on like 83. 89. Why is it so fun? I don't know. I'm, and I'm not a game person. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, a, either. I'm a, not a game person, but I'm addicted. Well, I can't figure it out. I don't play any other game, but I have to like get rid of it sometimes. Yeah. So I, don't play. I, I am so addicted. But what do you think it is about Candy Crush? I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know. I just started playing it and got it addicted because I don't have a job or anything, so I'm bored all the time. So. Do you, can you hear the music, though, when you play? If, with my headphones yeah, on. Yeah, because I like the music, too. Yes. It's so Sh- When soothing. it says sugar rush and yes. pasty and all that. Yes. yes. And exactly. Like, good job. Exactly. Yes. I love it. Yes. Spectacular. Yes, I'm addicted. <laughs> That's yes. so funny. I'm very addicted. But, yeah, yes. when it says sugar crush and the, like, the things get big, oh, you just feel so good about yourself. Yes, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I do. Yeah. Do you think actually when you play Candy Crush, you create a private space for It takes yourself? me, yes, exactly. It takes me away from here. Yes, it really, really does. Yes, it takes me away. All aboard! Delicious. I get what she's talking about with this Candy Crush, Nige. Mm-hmm. For me, it was solitaire because when I was playing it, I could kind of tune everything else out. You know, it was my alone time, which is really hard to get in prison. Oh, totally. And Erlon, mm. I have a theory about this. Okay, lay it on me. Okay, so just stick with me for a second, all right? So I think that you can call Candy Crush a kind of structure, even sort of a form of architecture. Hmm. <laughs> I, see, I see your look. Okay, let, let yeah, me, I, let I, me I, go I, further I, with Yeah, 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 please keep going. Okay, so it's a space, right? Right. Yes, it's an imaginary space, but it's still a space. And that woman we just heard from, Dorita, she's creating this Candy Crush space so that she can feel alone and have some kind of privacy. Mm-hmm. Starting to make a little sense? No, I hear you. I hear you. Okay, okay. And if you think about it, this is especially important. I mean, it's actually crucial in prison because prisons are designed so that you are never alone. Well, shit, yeah, they always have to have some eyes on you all the fucking time. That's what prison architecture is all about, surveillance. Yeah, exactly. But people need privacy. They need that teeny, tiny little bit of freedom that you can get when you feel that you're alone. True. So that's what we're exploring in this episode and in the next one. Prison architecture, real and imagined. This week, finding privacy. And Nige, Mm -hmm. for everyone that know you, Yes. They're going to say she sounds a little bit under the weather. I know. I have COVID. What? Uh, Yes. I thought I would get away without never having that (sighs) thing. But no, I got COVID. And so we are back in our closets again. Uh, You know what, though? (laughs) You've obscounded COVID for two years and some change. So I thought I was going to outrun it. I I mean, feel proud of that, you know? (laughs) I was proud that I got my comeuppance. So, yes, we are in our closets, which sounds about right for an episode about privacy. Yes. I'm Nigel Poor. I'm Erlon Woods, and this is Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. Hello. Yes, okay. To explore this idea of private spaces, we got to do a really exciting thing that kind of starts a new chapter for the show. We got to spend three days at a woman's prison. Nigel, can I sing this song real quick? Yes. By C.C. Pendleton. Well, lay it on me. Finally, it's <laughs> happened. <laughs> it happened to me. Oh, my God. We got inside, finally. Yes, yes, yes. The California Institution for Women, or CIW as it's called for short, is about 45 minutes outside of Los Angeles. Hello. Uh, your hustle, let's go. All, All right. right. We'll sit right across the hallway right here. Right. We did have a chaperone. Of course, CIW's version of Lieutenant Robinson. I'm Lieutenant Newport. How are we going? His name was Lieutenant Newborg, the prison's public information officer. 
We passed through this security station and then stepped out into this big open yard. And my first impression was it kind of looked a little bit like a community college. You know what I mean? Like a lot yeah. of one-story buildings connected right. by pathways and kind of scrubby landscaping. And Naj, mm-hmm. it was hot, as you remember. Oh, God, it was over 100 degrees. It was almost unbearable. And as we walked through the yard, it was barren. It was desolate. Just a few women posted up at a picnic table, giving us shit, of course. What the fuck? Who y'all recording? This prison sucks. And it felt a little weird. I mean, walking around this space where we knew nobody Mm -hmm. so that we could um, ask women about privacy. Right, but that's what we were there for. So we figured we'd start in the obvious place Mm -hmm. where people live, their cells. So we walk into the housing unit. We stepped into this small common area, and extending out was this long hallway with doors on either side, probably about like 10 to 15 doors, and each of those was a cell housing two women. And since there was no AC, there was these big, huge, like, swamp fan type shits that was in the end of each hallway. Is it possible to turn the fan off? Yeah. Just for, okay. Just looking at the sales, I don't know, Nod. Nah, seems like women at CIW have more privacy than guys do at San Quentin. Mm-hmm. I mean, at San Quentin, it's all bars. You know, you can see right into every single cell. Oh, I know, I know. And at CIW, every cell has a door of solid wood. And the only way to see in is through this little window that's about, I don't know, like six by ten inches. Right, right. And as we passed by each cell, I really wanted to look through those windows. I mean, I was just so curious. I felt like a peeper. Peeping Nigel. <laughs> and did you see what was um, keeping those doors from slamming shut? Yeah, I, I noticed that. Did it tell you we were indeed in a woman's prison? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were using sanitary napkins wrapped over the top of the doors so they wouldn't slam shut. Prison Ingenuity 101, door stoppers. Exactly. So we just started walking down the hall to see if anyone would uh, chit-chat with us. Oh, sorry. And normally, Erlon, if we were at San Quentin, we would just be shoving the mic in people's faces. But it was really different there. It was kind of like... A little hesitant. I, I mean, I, I understand that we were we were technically foreigners. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And we were being escorted by a PIO, so everybody's like, "Who is that? Who is that?" You know. And yeah. then we had microphones. You know what I'm saying? So they want to figure what that is. But as we was walking down that hall, this one woman had her door popped open. So we just kind of stuck our heads in there. It was like, "Hey, what up?" So we're doing this. Yeah, we do a podcast about life inside prison. Mm -hmm. And one of the episodes we're working on is about the architecture of prison. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, your room caught my attention. And I'm just curious, how do you feel about, what what do you call this? I call this my safe haven. What makes it a safe haven for you? Because it's things that I do to remind me of home. And this is, I shut out the the prison world. Can you tell us something? This woman's name was Marissa and Naj. She had really bonnarooed her cell. Totally. She had handmade curtains and a matching dust ruffle. I think that's what you call that thing that you put <laughs> under a mattress. Right, right. She had family photos all over the walls. And the way she had it decorated, it kind of reminded me of um, a college dorm, but like a, a freshman college dorm. I can't live like I'm in prison with blank walls and windows you can't cover and toilets you can't cover and all them things. I make it like home. (laughs) So, um, you wanted to talk to us? Yeah, I just wanted to see what you guys were about or what what was this, yeah, I was nosy, just being nosy. (laughs) There were a couple women who actually wanted to talk to us. There's always someone who likes having a mic in their face. Hello, how are you? Can you identify who you are and how long you've been down? Rachel Rodriguez, I've been down one year this time, this, this term. How many years in total? 26, um, like sporadically, like in half, you know, here, there, here, and there, but okay. a total of 26. So they call them a... Uh, uh, Life was uh, installment plan, yeah. That's exactly what they call it. I was trying to get the words. Yeah, <laughs> that's me, yeah. All the time. 
So can you tell me about where do you find privacy here? Privacy? When your monkey leaves for work and you're in there by yourself. That's the only time? That's the only time you have privacy. Or if you have a restroom that's in like an education that has a door. That's the only other place you have a... Um, privacy. Other than that, it's a it's a speak on your bunkie kind of terms, ask for privacy. Hey, can I get 10 minutes alone? Can I get five minutes alone to change whatever, use the restroom? But, uh, and you work with your bunkie, like most of the time with everything and everything, because they're part of you. You are part of them and they're part of you for the until you're gone. And do you have a, a bunkie that you get along with? Yeah, I got, yeah, I have a bunkie. She doesn't talk that much. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's great. I have a good bunkie. My name is uh, Catherine Carnero Elam. Um, I've been down in prison for 16 years. I had a 25 year sentence. Like many other women, we have a routine to create privacy and that's that she do a tent. If I need to focus and my bunkie's gotta be around, I'll put up like a sheet, fold a sheet and you, you get it connected and you're blocking your face, my face. So like you're enclosing yourself in your bunk? Yes, not the whole thing. Some people do feel like they need to do the whole thing. But a lot of us, it's just how much, even if it's a big towel or towel. And then I'm like, oh, okay, I'm in my space. And what kind of feeling comes over you when you do that? Oh, gosh. <laughs> a feeling um, releases stress. Um, I can think better. Yeah. During the day is the prison's time with me. My time with me is at night. This is Alice. We've talked to her on the phone before. She was actually in one of our episodes last season. And you could tell, even from those phone conversations, that um, she had an interesting perspective on things. And I was really curious to finally meet her. Alice is in her 70s, and like a lot of older women at CLW, she gets a cell all to herself. So that means she's alone a lot. Being bipolar helps a lot. I usually only require three, four, five hours. If I go to bed at eight, I'm up at one. That's when I do everything. I think at night. I work at night. That's my space. The minute they lock that door at eight o'clock, I'm in hog heaven. I know that door is not going to be opened again, unless I'm dead. And that means everything I do in there is uninterrupted. It allows me to do what I want to do. What words would you use to describe yourself? Is it your home? Is it your studio? What, what is it? I always kind of referred to it as the den. I call it the den because in my house that I had on the outside, I had a den where I had my desk and I had all my stuff. And so this is now my house. I just had to downsize. <laughs> That's all. So you, you, your den is currently in a large estate with a gated community. Yes, indeedy. <laughs> When we had first met Alice, she was in a different part of the prison. But I was curious on what her cell actually looked like. Oh, man, so was I. So Lieutenant Newborg asked her if it was okay if we went over to take a look. And this is it, right? This is her, this is her cell, correct? This is what she calls her den. When we arrived, Alice wasn't there yet. And Erlon, I have to say, it felt a little weird to kind of walk into her space like that. <laughs> but we were on a mission. So, of course, we took a peek. This is bigger than the San Quentin cell, ain't it, Nigel? Yeah, I mean, you can move around. Yeah, you can definitely move around. I was actually kind of relieved when Alice finally showed up. Oh, this is Alice. Hi, Alice. I was wondering if you could give us a little tour of your den. Oh, okay. This is my kitchen. You know, and I have my uh, heater where I heat up my water and what have you anyway and everything. So Alice's down, cell yeah. was pretty tidy and yeah. organized. Yeah. And also yeah. every inch was packed with stuff like toiletries and medications. And there was a notable amount of saltine crackers, Erlon. 
Did you check that out? I mean, it was like a Costco <laughs> amount. Yeah, them crackers will fill you up in a pinch with some water. I can tell you that, though. And like I said, down there are my, um, there's my office. There's my, all my writing materials. These two are my artwork and art supplies and what have you. Under the bunk bed, she had big plastic bins full of papers and stuff. Yeah, the lower bunk was set up for sleeping, and the top bunk she was using like a standing desk, you know, to put more of her property on. Yeah, exactly. And on the wall next to her mirror, she had these two small photos cut out from a magazine, you know, like a teenager would do. Hey, can you tell me why you have Elvis and, and Steve Tyler next to each other? I grew up being in love with Elvis, and... I am extremely fond of Aerosmith. I, I was a dancer for many years. I love dancing. I, I was um, raised in a family who kept us isolated from the world. And uh, in fact, Elvis was such a big no-no. And it wasn't until I was in my 30s or so that I discovered Aerosmith and their music. And usually what I do is, if I, when I go walking at the rec yard, I put my music on, and I'm sure I make quite a picture because, boy, when I walk, I rock. <laughs> wow. When we were talking earlier about private places, and you said this is like your den, when you're out walking around with your music on and you're just rocking out, does that feel private? Yeah. Can you talk about just a little bit about that? Why yeah, because uh, I miss the music and the dancing so much. And a lot of times I've been known to do it in here after hours. And I just hang on to the edge of the rail and I guarantee you I can rock and roll from here to Sunday. Especially if I'm listening to them, you know. For me, it's good exercise. You know, it gets everything pumping and I just have such a good time. Do you have a headset on or are you listening out loud? No, no. It's, I have a, yeah, I have a headset. Yeah, we wish we could see that. <laughs> yeah, several things. Any chance you could do it for us? Huh? Any chance you could put a headset on and... That would be funny. It would be. So Alice has her headset on. She's getting her she's, groove on. Yeah, she's, she's shaking a leg, as they say. She's... Uh -oh, so, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, she ain't playing. She ain't playing. She's listening to Addicted to Love. Oh, I thought oh, it was salsa. I know. Oh, wow. Wish I could She's, film this. She ain't playing. She's uh, listening to her high techer and uh, getting her swing on. She said, she said I just got to hold on to the bunk, but I'm good. She got the, she got the step. That's the step. She, like swing, dance, right? swing dance. Erlon, this was really one of the most memorable kind of visions I take away with me from our trip. I mean, it was such a private moment to see somebody in their own reverie. You know, it was it was awkward and beautiful. Um, I don't know. Seeing someone like that is kind of a kind of a gift. I think we were seeing a moment of freedom, Nige. I'm in it now. I know, I know pulling me off this dance and I'm in it. Now. I gotta get it in. Okay, Alice, sorry to interrupt you. We got the Looked like she forgot we was there, Nige. Mm hmm. <laughs> Great dancing. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Been a real slice of heaven, what can I tell you? <laughs> that was fun. Nice to spend time together. We're going to take a quick break. When we're back, the private spaces of San Quentin. I try to drown out the whole world. Either headphones or earplugs. Uh, I am a recluse. Erlon, we are back on familiar ground here. 
San Quentin. And this is Art Word. And I definitely remember this guy. I mean, of course you do. He's pretty memorable. Like Alice, he had his own cell. And I have to say his private space is pretty much a reflection of his inner being. You know what I mean? <laughs> like his inner psyche is projected onto those walls. Pretty much. I got like a hate corner and a love corner, you know. Well, the love corner is the picture of the people that write you. And uh, I would put my affirmations up on the wall. You know, I would have uh, uh, places in the world that I wanted to visit. You know, I'd have uh, real healthy stuff going on, you know. In the hate corner, I had a list of names, the people I wanted to take revenge on. I had different ideas on how to get back at them. Uh, I had pictures of things that I would use to get back at them. I used to get real specific. I used to be like, man, I hope her son come home late today. And lie and be telling her he did his homework and shit. He gonna disappoint the fuck out of her ass. I hope somebody steal her mail too and she don't get her insurance stuff, man. And, and fuck around in a fire hit, you know? Nobody hates you like a dude in jail. Then the list got too long. I had to knock motherfuckers off the list, you know, like you lucky motherfucker. I'm gonna be busy. Be busy whooping his ass, you know what I'm saying? So, and see, you know when I came to realize in the hate corner that everybody don't deserve to be hurt. You know, some people you just scratch the car up or something. You ain't got to penalize everybody with a rock upside the head, you know what I mean? The love corner was like an escape, and the hate corner was motivation. My name is Brandon Riddle Terrell. And how long have you been in prison? Uh, just over seven years. And what do you look like? I like to call myself a, a, a pretty boy biker. <laughs> I think that's a good description of him, a pretty boy biker. <laughs> so, and how would you describe yourself? Myself? Um, like uh, if you were on a rock star tour bus and, and, and like the little barrack on the tour bus, it, uh, I'd describe it like that. But you make the, that makes it sound cozy. No, if you've been on some of them, them buses, they're not cozy. They're actually triple bunk, some of them. <laughs> okay, but how about design-wise? Um, Describe to me design-wise. Paint scheme is black and white. White walls, all the trim and, and lockers and everything's black. It's a lot of white accents. Um, a lot of shelving and systematical kind of organization things, you know, to make the cell flow and, and function and... It has like a bike shop slash tattoo shop feel to it, like the posters and and pictures. So is it a pretty boy biker cell? Yeah, pretty boy biker cell. Obviously, we have the bars. It's the same size of a cell, but for me, it doesn't resemble a cell. I've done it just how I want it, and it, I took that away from the system. Like the system put me in a cell. Well, I'm gonna make this cell as comfortable as I can. And I wonder what it would be like for someone to move into your cell. They'd be juiced, because I know when done-up cells are, are emptied or, or someone moves out of them, like it's a rush to, to get in them. So there's like a little, it's like uh, like grabbing. Thing. It's like when somebody dies in New yeah. York, they try to get their apartment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then the view, I mean, you can't forget up there in West Block on the fifth tier, you got the view of Mount Tamil Pius and. Oh, you do? Yeah. I sit on my bunk and wake up to Mount Tam. 50 times a day, you see the ferries go by every morning. You see the kayakers out there. That's bittersweet because growing up in the area, you know, I'm very familiar with it. And, and in between the buildings at nighttime, you could see the 101 and the, the headlights going back and forth. And that used to be like a daily commute. My parents, you know, all my family, they all work here. So it's like so close, but yet so far away. Do you think you, they ever drive by and you see them? There's definitely been times I've been looking over there because my mom, she drives sometimes three or four times just on that little strip right there going back from Novato and Tiburon. It seems like you really view your cell as like a home and like a comforting place. I mean, if you have to be here. Absolutely. So end of the day and I come back to the cell, 
it's like yeah at least I, I you know everything's organized I can relax get some food and not feel like I'm in a cell and, and the reason why I like the analogy of of the the shop garage style is because it, it's not permanent it's temporary you go to the shop and then you go home yeah it's, it, it's my shop it's my garage because eventually I'm going to be home with the family It was, you know, one one metal bunk, uh, toilet in the sink. And uh, back then, it was a light fixture in the middle of the roof where you screw the light bulb in, a little chain. And then at the bottom, it was a vent with a TV cable coming out of the vent. And um, that was it. I'm like, okay, uh, I'm here now. I bet some listeners may remember Al Watson. He spent 36 years in prison on death row. And on the row, everyone has their own cell, and they pretty much never leave it. Yeah, I mean, you rarely see them outside unless they're being escorted to, say, like medical. And even then, Erlan, I mean, you know this protocol. You're supposed to stop when they walk by and not even look at them. You can call it privacy, but really, it's isolation. Is it loud on death row? It's very quiet. You can hear individuals, televisions turning. You can hear individuals hitting keys on their typewriters. There's no noise, really. Everybody's into their own world. It's very quiet. So there's like 740 worlds up there. Mm -hmm. Can you describe your world there? A lot of loneliness, sadness. Uh, it became to the point where uh, that just came became routine. Okay, this is what it is, you know. Uh, a lot of cell time, cell studies, uh, trying to find ways to spend my time. You know, a lot of a lot of radio, a lot of television, um, a lot of books, um, working out. That was pretty much it. During Al's time, the guys on the row were pretty much just waiting. My mindset, I'm thinking, okay, maybe be executed in a couple of years or so. And um, time started to move. Ordered some little stuff, TV, radio. How did you start making that place your home? Um, it was never home. I existed there. Then something really surprising happened for Al. He was actually resentenced, and he was moved down to the general population. That first night, when I came out of the dining hall, I just happened to look up. It tripped me out. I forgot all about that type of stuff. I'm looking up while I'm walking, just admiring this. When I got back to the cell, I actually realized, man, I haven't even seen the moon and the stars in a long, long time. Tell us a little bit about the family visiting area. It's like a little apartment. There's a little area to hang coats and stuff. Kitchen. The little living room area where you can, you know, sit on the couch, watch TV. So in this episode, we've mostly been talking about cells and how some people can find privacy there. But there's these other areas in the prison, too, where for a short period of time, you can feel a bit more free, like have some separation from prison life. And one of those spaces is the family visiting cottage. It's a small building inside the prison where you can actually go spend a couple of uninterrupted days with your family. And it's sort of prison and sort of not. It's this in-between space. And Erlon, I know you never had the opportunity to actually do one of these family visits. Nah, I didn't qualify because I was a lifer. But our friend Tommy did, so we asked him to describe the place. It's two bedrooms, one for the kids, one for the adults, and there's a little bathroom with a shower, so... Just going there makes you feel like you're not in prison. 
you know. So what was it like for the first time to go there and have such a different space after you'd been in a prison oh, wow. for like at least 12 years, right? It was a little, it was a little much. For one, you, in prison, you, you're, you're kind of like, you keep up a wall, you keep up a mask in an exterior to where you don't want people to get too close to you. And so when somebody's finally allowed to get close to somebody, it feels different. I don't want people getting too close to me. Even just hugging my wife for an extended period of time, you know, it produced a lot of anxiety. One moment in particular, she's asleep on my chest, watching TV, uh, I'm watching TV. And I hear outside the door, you know, a motorcycle revving. And I hear cars, you know, from the COs. They have a, a parking lot right by there. So I'm hearing all these sounds that I'm not used to hearing and I'm, my heart starts to beat very, very uh, heavily. And it wakes my wife up. She's like, what's, what's wrong? Her heart, her heart beating woke her up? Yeah. So I'm, I'm having like a kind of a, a panic attack. And I'm like, this is, it just feels weird. I'm not used to this, you know. And her being so close to me was kind of uh, uncomfortable. And I'm like, this is, it just feels weird. I'm not used to this. Just hugging, just hugging, just holding hands and felt uncomfortable. Like it was just too much closeness? Yeah, well... At that time, it was 12 years without any contact, any human contact. It's like, you know, it's cool, <laughs> but for too long, now I'm getting uncomfortable. It also became to the point where when I would leave, I know that I have to come right back to this, to this, this prison. And so those moments of openness and intimacy and understanding that you grow with your, with your, your partner, your significant other, it's beautiful, but it, it it became for me, like I'm tired of going back, you know, where I have to close back off again. There, there started to be another wall that I was building there, even while I was in the visit with my wife. Erlon, I'm gonna play you something. Okay. What do you have in your pockets? <laughs> My ID and my work card and a pen. That's it. That's it. Do you, when you were on a higher level, what did you carry in your pockets? Uh, a sharpened pencil. <laughs> <laughs> did you like to draw? Or? <laughs> nah. You want to tell me why you're asking people about their pockets, not? So mostly we've been talking about prison architecture and privacy, right? right? You know, like in terms of cells and the family cottage and places where you can find some bit of privacy in prison. Right. But I actually think that pockets are a form of architecture, too. They're personal architecture. Obviously, it's this very small space, but it's a space that affords you a little bit of privacy because you carry things in there that are just meant for you. And when I think about the pocket in terms of architecture, I think about how it gives you not just a sense of privacy, but a little bit of freedom, mm. right? And that's really what we're talking about this episode, how privacy is a glimmer of freedom. So we've been asking everyone this to tell us about what's in your pocket. What oh, do you carry in your pocket? Um, my ID, lyrics to a song, and my mask. I don't think I know this cat, Naj. No, you don't. This is Tom, and he hasn't been at San Quentin for very long. But the other day, he came down to the media lab, and New York and I sat him down so we could talk to him. What song? Oh, I, I like, I do, like, I write music. Oh, your own music. Yeah, I write my own song. I, I can't hear it in your pocket. Are you, <laughs> no. Come on, let me hear it, man. Do you sing? Yeah, like, I, I do. Please. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I don't know if you want these lyrics, though. I don't, we, we haven't well, heard them. No. We decide. Never. Look, I, so, it, it's an old song I wrote. So it goes, uh, you just want my body. <laughs> I just want your body. And, uh, I, yeah, I don't think I, I read the rest of this. Yeah, yeah, so it was good. It, it was good. It, uh, oh, yeah. You can go. Just that, a little more. Just a little more. It just, yeah, it just leads into me saying that we're just doing things. 
Can I say that? You just say it. I just, that's it. No, that's oh, it. Just oh. like, I just like, <laughs> okay, okay, I'll okay. let you check it out later. But it sounds cr- I'm laughing as I'm doing it because I didn't expect you to ask me about something in my pocket. But Why do you got to stick it out your pocket then? It was just because it's there. It's just in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have your mask, your ID, your lyrics. And a pen. And a pen. Yes. Um, when you were at your most high-level prison, what would you have in your pocket? Um, I would just have my ID. But I didn't carry anything on me because I didn't want to lose anything because something happened. If you can't bring your radio, it's just like you're going to lose it. Um, you'll break it if somebody's attacking you. Or, you know, the, you get put down and the cops come and search you, they might break it. So you just don't carry anything on you if you don't so want to. So that's a pretty big difference then. Like if you think about your clothes or your pocket as architecture. Yes. Like that is very different. Yeah, like now I would carry more stuff. It just so happens this is all I had. But like generally you'll see guys like walking around with their lunch and folders worth the stuff sometimes i come down here with my guitar but um if i would have had it i would have never brought it with me because i don't want to lose it right so now how do you think about what the service of your pocket oh what does it mean to you now i could put a bunch of stuff in there that i might need like um pens maybe some food like snacks in my pocket and i don't think much of it because i'm not worried about getting jumped on or you know participating in some kind of violence would it be fair to say that the pocket with things in it is sort of a symbol of maybe a little more safety? You know what? I never really thought about it like that until you started bringing it up. But I, I think more freedom, maybe uh, even safety, because I feel like I'm not going to lose anything. Okay, so remember my theory about pockets being this really tiny form of prison architecture? Yep, yeah, I'm with you. Well, our next episode, we are going to zoom way, way out. We're going to talk about the big public spaces in prison. The yards, the hallways, the layout, all that shit. The whole prison. But first, one more thing about CIW that we got to get in here before we go. All right, well, uh, my name is Ashley Karina Garcia. I'm just 20 years old. I've been here for almost a year already. And can I ask you, do you have any yeah. pockets? Pockets? I do not. They do not let us have Why? pockets here. Well, because <laughs> well, I guess they think it's like a, a, a safety thing. I guess they don't want to do the extra work of patting us down. Most of the time, I'm carrying a pen just in case. All right, so like... Okay, it's just like outside of prison. <laughs> Women never get as many pockets as men do. Never. But you know prison got all kind of crazy rules about women and men, right? Like, Mm -hmm. women get sugar candy, like Skittles and now laters and all that, and men don't get none of that shit. I don't even know why I'm going to ask, but uh, which would you prefer, pockets or candy? Candy. (laughs) (laughs) I can make them pockets with needle and thread, you know what I'm saying? I Give me the candy. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Um, do you do you carry anything private on your person? Like, do you have pockets that you keep things in, or no, no, no? <laughs> why not? Um, well, I don't have any pockets. Yeah, why so. don't why don't women have pockets? <laughs> I don't. It's the clothes that they sell. They, yeah. So, how does it make you feel that you can't carry things that you might need with you? I never really even thought about it because you get so used to it that it doesn't become like something that you really think about as yeah. long as i have my id or whatever and if i don't have a a pocket like you know s- excuse me women have secret pockets well you know we put everything at the top and then there is there <laughs> oh man this thing about secret pockets erlon it just got me so excited You know, thinking about the possibility of spending more time at the women's prison and also pondering what kinds of stories we're going to get out of there. Oh, we're going to get some very different stories. I can guarantee that. But I know we've got some things to work on because listening to our interviews, I can hear how tentative our voices are. It's like we just haven't made that connection yet. Really? I thought we was doing good. But I'll say baby steps, Nige, baby steps. We're going to get it. We're going to get there. Ear Hustle would like to thank Lieutenant Newborn, Associate Warden Lewis, Acting Warden Corps, Mr. Mom, 
the team at Poetic Justice, and everyone else who hosted us so generously at the California Institution for Women. This episode was produced by me, Nigel Poor. And me, Erlon Woods, along with Amy Standin, Neroli Price, Rasan New York Thomas, and Bruce Wallace, with help from Tony Tafoya and Rashid Zinneman. It was sound designed and engineered by Erlon Woods, with help from Fernando Arruda, and it features music by Antoine Williams, Rashid Zinneman, Phil Phillips, Fernando Arruda, and David Jossi. And Erlon, you snuck some of your own music in there too. <laughs> Amy Standin edits the show. Shepnam Sigmund is our managing producer. And Bruce Wallace is our executive producer. Thanks to Warden Ron Broomfield. And as you know, every episode of Ear Hustle has to be approved by this guy here. So this is Lieutenant Sam Robinson, the public information officer at San Quentin State Prison. Uh, For those of you out there, remember it's election time, so make sure you're registered and get out to vote. And otherwise, I will say that I approve this episode. This episode was made possible by the Just Trust, working to amplify the voices, vision, and power of communities that are transforming the justice system. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter, The Lowdown. This week, you can see some photos from our time at CIW and find out how to watch us live in conversation with Piper Kerman as part of San Francisco's One City, One Book, celebration of our book. And everybody know Piper Kerman, Orange is the New Black, right? And our friend. So subscribe to The Lowdown at EarHustleSQ.com slash newsletter. And Erlon, um, you've been kind of busy because this is not the only podcast where our listeners can catch you this week, is it? Nope. I haven't gotten any sleep nights. It's been hard. <laughs> <laughs> the folks at the Wrongful Conviction podcast asked me to sit in their host seat this week. Wrongful Conviction features one-on-one interviews with folks who have spent years in prison for crimes they did not commit. Right. And Naj, guess what? What? This was their 300th episode. And I got to talk with this one cat named Karamai Cunley, who, and I think he was like 18, he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, plus like 12 life sentences for mm-hmm. a crime he did not commit, had nothing to do with. Um, oh, which is sad. So. You can find Wrongful Conviction wherever you get your podcast. We also have a link in our show notes. Good job, partner. Indeed. You sound great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And we have one more very special thank you before we go. That's right. This is to listener Melanie Kale, who donated to our latest fundraiser. She's back east in Brooklyn. And Erlon, she has been listening since episode one. Ooh, well, we didn't we didn't took up some of her time, huh? Yes, we did. <laughs> so we definitely owe her a big thanks. That's what's up. And I love this part of her of her letter nights. One of the reasons she was interested in our show right off the bat was because of her favorite high school English teacher. Melody says he was this totally jack dude that coached wrestling and loved poetry and short stories. Before teaching us, he taught poetry in prison. It always stuck with me. And I love that Nigel started by teaching art. Oh, that's what's up. Thanks so much, Melanie. Yeah, them English teachers are the shit. Oh, they are. Shit, isn't it? Ear Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Radiotopia is a collection of independent, listener-supported podcasts. Some of the best podcasts around. Hear more at radiotopia.fm. I'm Nigel Poor. I'm Erlon Woods. Thanks Thanks for for listening. listening. I went like six years without a celly. The side effect was I started talking to myself and playing weird ass games. I sit on the toilet way at the other side of the cell, be trying to spit a loogie all into the water. But this is after like two years of solitary confinement. Your man Wilson wasn't nothing. With Tom Hanks and Wilson on, on that uh, uh, castaway, man, that shit wasn't nothing. I wish I had a ball to talk to. Radio Tokyo.